So the second Vajra statement uh, of chapter 5. So we are always, you know, uh, as I said, uh, we always read and we always hear people say, um, oh, you need empowerment, you need empowerment to this, do this practice, you need empowerment to do that practice. Uh, I have the empowerment, I don't have the empowerment, this, so on and so forth. So on the relative level, uh, when they people say I have, or relative in the sense of like, you know, common talk, when people say I have the empowerment, I don't have the empowerment, yeah, they're talking about, you know, <laughs> whether they have gone to, you know, a, a, the ritual empowerment when it's given or not, you know, with the assumption that, you know, well, I went there, you know, then I must have received the empowerment. So uh, in this Vajra statement, you know, Jigden Simgun uh, uh, makes the point that uh, that that is not how uh, that is not how the real meaning of empowerment is. The real meaning of empowerment, of course, is like what is empowerment, and then here it's not so much talking about what is empowerment; it's talking more, you know, how do you know? you have received uh, empowerment. And so here he says, uh, you have received empowerment uh, when the true meaning of empowerment arises in the mental continuum. Uh, maybe uh, I would modify this uh, state, this translation here a little. Uh, here, right, the true meaning of empowerment arises in the mental continuum. Uh, this might give us the impression that um, it is something that happens without rhyme or reason. Like the meaning, the true meaning arises in the mental continuum. Right? Uh, it, it, it gives the impression uh, that how that it kind of mysteriously arises. So maybe a better way of phrasing this is uh, one obtains empowerment uh, when uh, you recognize the true meaning of empowerment. So it's something that we have to do. Yeah, it's something that uh, <clears throat> requires us to be proactive about it. You know, it's not like, oh, you know, wait around and see if it's going to happen or not. <laughs> uh, empowerment doesn't happen that way. You have to participate in the interdependence of the empowerment. Uh, so, so this is important. Yeah. So the commentary. One cannot fathom whether someone is a supreme or mediocre Vajra master. So, so here, uh, <clears throat> Chodra's uh, commentary, pretty long. Uh, he divides it uh, into. Hmm, uh, let's see. Hold on, yeah. uh, okay, let's. Uh, it's uh, Sobish that will kind of divide it further. Yeah? And, and part of it is, again, uh, you know, kind of mm, responding to Sakya Pantita's uh, criticisms, uh, which, you know, we don't need to go into that. Yeah. But let's just go from here. So, so, so Chodra is going to um, address this by first starting to talk about, instead of the recipient of empowerment, uh, he starts by talking about first uh, the one giving the empowerment. Uh, so he says, with regards to the one giving the empowerment, um, it's often difficult for the receivers to really know, you know, is this person giving the empowerment a supreme Vajra master or a so-so 
by Charmaster. Master. <laughs> yeah, is this a, <clears throat> you know, highly advanced, uh, realized uh, by Master Master or mediocre? <clears throat> And so one is not going to obtain empowerment through an inferior master's presentation of a merely systematic teaching of the ritual. Ah, so then he says, you know, first of all, it's hard for you to tell. Then furthermore, if the master can just basically perform the ritual, presentation of a merely systematic teaching of the ritual. Okay, now this is happening. 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 Then he says, you're not going to receive the empowerment that way. It is necessary that, beginning with the ritual preparation of entering the mandala, up to the completion of the main part of the empowerment, all of which brings forth the meaning of the empowerment, each of the different individual qualities successively arise in the disciple's mental continuum. So in fact, what he seems to be saying here is that when he talks about this inferior Vajra master uh, of a merely systematic teaching of the ritual, here, to me, what he's saying is that if this person giving the empowerment is simply going through the ritual and even with explanation, and much less these days, you know, even explanations are not given. <laughs> but even if explanation is given, he's saying, if the students don't recognize or don't understand, right, the step one, don't gain uh, some understanding uh, of step one of the empowerment. Then to go on to step two, step three, step four, step five, uh, he says, this is not going to work. Because each of the different individual qualities have to successfully, successively uh, recognize instead of the word arise, has to be recognized by the disciple, has to be understood by the disciple. So for example, we talk about the four empowerments. So when it says empowerment here, it, it basically means this whole process of the four empowerments. If you did not understand vase empowerment, and then vase empowerment in the elaborate empowerment, like Gala Chakra, vase empowerment is divided into 11 parts. Or sometimes seven parts. And each part, you know, some, some aspect of our nature is being conveyed through these steps. So Trudra is emphasizing here how if you do this correctly, if you do this as it is meant uh, to, to be done, then uh, just going through, you know, the whole ritual text uh, doesn't cut it. Moreover, it is necessary that Cleaning the stains of the three venues and of grasping them as different, one brings forth the four Vajras and carries out the stages of cultivation and completion as something endowed with the efficacy of practice. Thereby the meaning of empowerment must arise. So here he is giving um, the more detailed steps, uh, cleaning the stains of the three venues, grasping them as different, uh, grasping uh, um, uh, is to clean grasping uh, and to and the stains of the three venues, 
the four virtuous, and so on. So these are the stages. So he says these stages have to be endowed with the efficacy of practice. Meaning you have to practice to experience. So that's the commentary by Vajrapani says, here the means of empowerment is an empowerment since it causes one to possess a blissful mind, which is, so, so he explains further huh, this quote. But what is the true meaning of the empowerment? If one is introduced to the constituents of the person, uh, meaning uh, what constitutes you, well, right now, the sense organs, the sense objects, sense consciousness, and so on, as the five Buddhas and so on, and strong conviction regarding that arises, then the vase empowerment is obtained. Yes, so he's going to go through the four empowerments and that what needs to be realized. Similarly, if the samadhi, uh, the meditative concentration, that, uh, that possesses the joy of the purification of the 80 innate thoughts of Datu arises, that is the secret empowerment. Uh, these 80 thought patterns are related to uh, aversion, attachment, uh, uh, and uh, confusion. So if, if the purification of the, these 80 states of mind uh, takes place, uh, if you recognize, then you can say, okay, secret empowerment was received. If one experiences luminosity through the stages of the four natural innate joys, namely the superficial bliss of melting, that is the empowerment of discriminative knowledge, the third empowerment. If by the verbal introduction of gnosis, which is the superficial similitude of the third empowerment, one realizes the actual meaning, that is the actual gnosis of Mahamudra, the Vajra Yoga endowed with the seven limbs, the fourth empowerment is obtained. Uh, don't worry, uh, now we are in the area of Vajrayana, there's a lot of technical terms. Uh, you don't need to know all of it. Uh, the gist, because over this chapter, we'll learn more and more, right, what these terms mean. But here, uh, in this commentary here, the gist is, these four empowerments, again, you know, nowadays when empowerments are done, uh, at most uh, three days, then you, quote unquote, receive the four empowerments. But Chodra is saying, you know, like, that's not the true meaning of empowerment. But nonetheless, I believe even in Chodra's time, still empowerments are done this way, eh? at most three days or four days. Eh? Then often, in fact, eh? one morning. <laughs> okay, now you receive the first empowerment. Okay, now second empowerment. Okay, now the third empowerment. Okay, now fourth empowerment. Like there's a concise way of giving the four empowerments. But if you follow like Kalachakra system, you know, the first vase empowerment, there are eight, 11 parts. And then each part, you know, has its own thing. And so Kalachakra takes like three days. So to me, I think uh, Chodra is not saying, you know, like necessarily that don't do empowerments in this way. He's saying, insofar as you receiving the empowerment, it takes more than attending these empowerment rituals. And so if you put the two together, right, the way empowerment rituals are done commonly, and, you know, how empowerment actually occurs, then to me, what it's saying is, yeah, you go, you go to these empowerment rituals, but you have to understand that 
This is like going to see how things are done for many, many, many times. <laughs> and as you practice, as you practice, as you practice, the empowerment will unfold in conjunction with your practice. So continuing, having that in mind, there are three types of people. So now here is three types of people in terms of recipients of empowerment. The supreme type of adepts realize the four empowerments as soon as the four are introduced by mere words. And then, like King Indrabhuti, they are liberated. So giving one example, this ancient king was so advanced that he received the four empowerments merely by the master uh, using words, uh, no ritual, uh, no elaborate things, just the master's words uh, he recognized. And then, uh, in one session, so to say, all four empowerments, uh, Kin Indra Bhutti, uh, got it, liberated. The average adepts experience independent of the path of liberation, the meaning of all the individual segments of the empowerment through understanding and realizing the key points of the practice. The lowest, however, say, one obtains empowerment if one produces an understanding of the verbal meaning of the empowerment and a strong mental conviction arises. And so this, the lowest, uh, however, uh, is uh, when uh, we have a strong mental conviction. Oh, yes, this must be true. Uh, I believe I receive. Uh, so then uh, you receive. <laughs> however, if the mind does not produce even the mere meaning, uh, if the mind doesn't get the meaning of the individual empowerments, one does not obtain empowerment because that is no different from bestowing the empowerment on earth and stones. <laughs> it's, a, it's like giving empowerment to you know stones and rocks. Right? No matter how man, how great the Vajra Master, that stone and rock is not going to turn into a Buddha. Therefore, on this occasion, the intention is not that if the meaning of the empowerment, that is, the meaning of the four empowerments, arises irreversibly in the mental continuum, one obtain, obtains it, and if it does not arise, one does not obtain it. So here Chodra is saying, okay, but we are not saying that unless, right, uh, when it says the meaning arises, we're not saying that uh, you achieve Buddhahood. We're not saying that. He says, we're not going that far. Now, even if he, uh, Kyopa emphasizes, right, that uh, unless you recognize uh, the kind of take-home lesson from each of these empowerments, you, you have not received the empowerment. That also is not saying uh, that it arises irreversibly. If that were the case, he says, obtaining empowerment would not exist today. <laughs> in this context, Lord Naropa indeed said that at the time the empowerment is bestowed, the path of seeing arises and also ceases in the same moment. However, that is designated path of seeing on the level of similitude gnosis. Whereas the actual path of seeing that follows the Supreme Dharma is something that is taught to be without cessation. Therefore, it is like that. Okay, simplify. <laughs> yeah, simplify. So the, the point he's making uh, to elaborate on Kyopo Rinpoche's statement is this. Kyopo Rinpoche's statement is, mm, basically he's saying, mm, it's not enough uh, for you to just go to an empowerment and you say, I believe I have received it. Why? Oh, because I really trust the Vajra Master. Uh, and so he has done the thing. So, of course, I've received it. 
And Kyopas said, no, no, no. You have not received it. Because you have no, if you have no idea what the Vajra Master did, and if you did not, you know, participate, uh, in, in other words, like they say, you know, uh, empowerment is not a spectator sport. Uh, it's not like watching football on Monday night. It's not a spectator sport. Uh, it's a participatory sport. So if you were at an empowerment, uh, but you cannot or did not uh, actually participate and follow, uh, and then the meaning arises, then Kyoba says, well, then you have not received it. Then uh, probably Sakya Pandita or someone uh, later said, wait, if that was the case, uh, and they want to say what Kyoba is saying is ultimate receiving of empowerment, uh, meaning like you become a Buddha on the spot. Here is saying, no, 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 we are also not saying that. Uh, between Simply believing you received it because you were there right, and the master is so great, that doesn't cut it. But neither are we saying that you only receive the empowerment when the meaning of that empowerment is irreversibly realized within you, right? which is like very close, huh? eighth bumi, tenth bumi. Right? It says, we are also not saying that. So then uh, Chodra's uh, commentary says, now you will find in Naropa's writings that during the ritual of empowerment, there is a moment where uh, under the right circumstance, the disciple could achieve the path of seeing which is like the first Bhumi, right? But here, Naropa says, this first Bhumi that you, you, you come across uh, in some tantric texts that say, you know, the disciple with the right conditions uh, could achieve the first Bhumi during an empowerment. That kind of first Bhumi is not, uh, it's a facsimile, it's like a, preview, a taste uh, of the actual first Bhumi that you know, takes time to achieve. Okay? In other words, like under the right circumstance, uh, it's possible to have a glimpse of what the first Bhumi is during empowerment. But that is, as it says, you know, um, uh, the path of arising, the path of seeing arises and ceases in that same moment. Right? And this is not uh, the actual path of seeing, which is first Bhumi. Right? It's not the actual path of seeing of Bodhisattvas. Right? For, for the actual path of seeing achieved, then there's no going back anymore. Yeah. So what Chodra is clarifying here is when Kyopa says uh, the meaning of the empowerment arises, he is not setting the standard so high right, as to say, unless you achieve the first Bhumi, right, you are not, yeah, you have not achieved empowerment. Yes? Before we continue, I'll pause here. So you're saying that you can receive something, a glimpse. Uh-huh. But that glimpse is not the real thing. It yeah, it's a facsimile. 
a facsimile, but that can be motivating. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's a reflection of the real thing. And that is, in a way, Chodra is saying, that is what Kyopa means by the meaning arising. The meaning arising need not mean, you know, like, oh, now no more confusion. But the meaning arising means you, you get it like, oh, no more confusion is like this. Oh, and then, oh, wait. <laughs> Maybe a day later, it's like, uh, so what was it again? The rest of the commentary is um, uh, <laughs> sparring with Sakya Pandita. <laughs> It's sparring is for Sakya Pandita. We, we don't need to go into that. Right? It's talking about, you know, uh, how many students uh, are allowed in each empowerment because Sakya Pandita is a stickler uh, to the rules, right? Uh, it says no more than 25. Uh, uh, and you people do these empowerments with 100 people. Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, and so on and so forth, you know, all, all these other details. We don't need to go into that. Instead, let's look at the notes, okay? Mm, then also, you know, again, sparring with uh, Sakya Pandita uh, uh, on like uh, uh, the four empowerments, you know, each of them, uh, what distinguishes one from the other, uh, and, and then also like uh, do you need a, a, a sand mandala? And so, of course, according to Sakya Pandita, absolutely you need that. Without something like that, empowerment cannot be given. Whereas the kagyupas are the loosey-goosey ones. Yeah? Then I say, no, you know, even just the guru's body itself uh, can be displayed as a mandala to a disciple that is uh, like ready. So what's going on there is basically, right, the sand mandala or the mandala in Borobudur, which is 3D and, you know, full-sized, right, that is used to communicate the divine, uh, pristine nature of this body, right? So that is the symbol. Uh, this is the symbolized. Well, not this, but the true nature of this is the symbolized, right? The symbol is the sand mandala. Right, or you know, like Bora Bordeaux itself, uh, that structure. So, according to Sakya Pandita, basically, uh, you know, he's like, you know, it's important to follow all these rules. So, the only way uh, you can lead students to understanding the symbolized is through the symbol. So, he says it's indispensable, the symbol. Uh, the Gagyupas are going to say, if, if you don't have the symbol, right, you don't have a sand mandala, you don't have a painted mandala, but the point is to lead students to understand the nature of the symbolized, then you can use this body. But for Sakya Pandita, it's like, no, that's not acceptable. <laughs> Anyway, 403, uh, in the notes, Rinjen Changchub, according to him, the minimum qualifications of a Vajra master is that, uh, quote, entering the stages of cultivation in a state of clear and stable awareness or knowing, clear and stable knowing, he has obtained stability on the stage of cultivation and warmth on the stage of completion. So cultivation, stage of cultivation is generation stage or creation stage. 
So this Vajra master needs to have at least a stable generation stage. So able to visualize the deity clearly. Then warmth on the completion stage, meaning you know a particular level of able to to um, properly practice the completion stage, have experience of the completion stage to the level known as warmth. Yeah. So in other words, the the Vajra master giving the empowerment needs to have a certain level of attainment and experience in terms of the two aspects of deity yoga, the creation stage and the completion stage. Then the marks of the disciple. What are the qualifications of the disciples? Must be at least such that they have purified the mental continua, purified their minds, through practices starting with taking common refuge up to the preliminaries. So you need wonder. But here we're not talking about, you know, finishing 100,000 this, 100,000 that, but you have to have taken refuge from the heart and understand what refuge means. <laughs> you have to understand the faults of negative karma and therefore, you know, done purification, such as Vajrasattva, such as the 35 Buddhas or whatever means of purification that has the four powers. You need to cultivate a, a, a mind of, you know, generosity and giving through mandala. All those, all those, you need to have that. So that the mind has to be at least yeah, uh, endowed with that. Then thrice supplicated the Vajra Master, yeah, like supplicated, asked the Vajra Master three times, uh, at least. Uh, that means, uh, I mean, it doesn't have to be literally in my mind three times, you know, but that, that means like you really want this, you know, and not just, oh, yeah, I think I'm free that Sunday, so I'll go to the empowerment. Okay, you'll never receive anything. Yes. So you want, you need to really want, right? And also a lot of times, you know, like, I'm, I mean, I'm sure, you know, you said, you know, I, that's how I started. You know, I saw a poster uh, and then I went, I have no idea what's going on. So it's not saying that that's not good. It's just saying, well, that's not empowerment, you know. And don't go around saying, oh yeah, I went to the empowerment. I got the empowerment, yeah because the disciples need to have at least those qualities and abandon the adverse conditions, meaning abandon the conditions that prevent you from receiving the empowerment. Yeah? So what are some of the conditions? Uh, you don't trust the person giving the empowerment. I say, eh, I think he's doing this to make money. Well, it's not going to work <laughs> if you think like that. It's beside the point whether this person is actually doing that or not. If you think this person is doing that, then already it's not going to work. Yeah. There are also certain procedures mentioned concerning the preparation and the ritual itself, where one must perform particular branches of the empowerment at different gates of the mandala, at particular times of the day or night, and so forth. However, even if one has undergone the correct ritual as prescribed and thinks, oh, now huh, all the details of the ritual is complete. Oh, I have obtained empowerment, right? I mean, Chen Chan Chu points out that the ritual correctness alone cannot cause the meaning of the empowerment uh, to arise. The, the correctness of the ritual alone uh, doesn't guarantee that the empowerment has taken place. He says, sometimes the ritual is merely performed. According to the commentaries of Gongjik, empowerment is usually a gradual process of purification and transformation. Yeah, so the Gongjik commentaries show that Gilbert Rinpoche's understanding of empowerment is not a one-time deal. It's a gradual process of unfolding. Except for someone like King Indra Bhuti, it was instantaneous. 
But for most of us, it's a gradual process of purification and transformation. So Jigden Sumgun is cited by Ch Rinjen Changchup as saying, the understanding of mantra empowerment is such that it is taught to be the empowerment that purifies ordinary body, speech, and mind, and the mind grasping these three as different. The understanding of empowerment is only complete when the complete result of purification and transformation arises, right, is recognized. This may occur only after a long process. Renjeng Changchup and Doje Shirap state the example of Geshe Potowa, one of the Kadamba masters, who had been fully ordained for 30 years. When then he said, you know, after he was ordained for 30 years, ordained as a monk, so this example is not even an example of someone receiving empowerment. Because this principle applies to all levels of like uh, ordination, initiation, whatever you call it. You know, Again, in Gongchik, we don't tend to separate things into, oh, this is Hinayana level, therefore the standards is like this. This is Mahayana level, therefore the standards are different. This is Vajrayana, the standards are different. No, it's like one standard, applied in all these different contexts. So this first example given is Geshe Potowa. It's one of the famous Kadampa masters. So one of the ancestors of Kagyu lineage. Uh, it said that 30 years after he became a monk, he said this, today, the disciplined conduct of renunciation arose in me. My preceptor, my kempo, a preceptor. A kempo means actually preceptor. So originally the, the title kempo is referring to the person that gives monastic vows. That's the original meaning of kempo. But here he says, my kempo is that layman of rating, which is an odd statement. Who is this layman of rating? His teacher who was the main disciple of Atisha. So even though Atisha himself was a monk and emphasized very much uh, how helpful it is to practice Dharma by becoming a monk, interestingly, his successor, his main successor in Tibet, never became a monk. Uh, neither was he married. It is said that he practiced uh, like a monk, but he never uh, kind of formally uh, took the robes, shaved his head, but he lived uh, like a monk, but he never officially took the vows. So therefore, he, he, he is not able, even however realized he is, he is not able to ordain. Like you cannot make someone something that you are not, <laughs> according to proper Vinaya rules. But here, this monk said, my Kempo is the layman of reading. This refers to his master, Dromtum Gyawe Jungne. He indicates thereby that the meaning of ordination, just as here in this context, the meaning of empowerment, may only arise long after a ritual act has been performed and independent of the usual conditions. As here, the preceptor is said to be Jom Tom, who as a layperson normally would not serve as a preceptor at an ordination. Yeah. So basically, Geshe Potowa is saying, even though I became a monk, I received the ritual. I went to the ritual 30 years ago. And the essence of becoming a monk is through renunciation. And he said, but it's through the last 30 years of practicing what my teacher taught. Tom right? Tom, the lay person, the non-monk. Right? But the non-monk really understood about renunciation. And I followed his instructions and I practiced and I practiced and I practiced. Now, 30 years later, today I can say, I am a true monk now. The meaning has arisen. Likewise, Gampopa attained the full realization of empowerment 
only after, quote, practicing based on the teaching of Jetsun Miller for six years in the Neogi Seba Valley without leaving his seat. So Kampopa received instructions and empowerment from Milarepa, but it wasn't until six years of intensive retreat that at this point, I think Milarepa has passed away. Then Kampopa one day, you know, said, and today, I finally received that empowerment. Therefore, true empowerment is obtained with the arising of realization that evolves from the blessing of practicing the authentic Guru's pith instructions and from one's devotion to the Guru. So without getting into, you know, too like a uh, nitpicking, which is what happens, you know, uh, when uh, Gongchik is subjected to scholarly debates. Then in defending Gongchik, I think sometimes uh, the defenders of Gongchik walk into the trap and then get stuck in the trap. <laughs> so for some of us, you know, we're like, don't, don't play that game. That is the bandita game. Don't even go there. So without getting too, you know, hair splitting about this, the main point of this statement is just because you went to an empowerment doesn't mean you have received an empowerment. In fact, you probably did not. In order to truly receive, it takes time. So that's why I've said, you know, my suggestion is like, Whenever you have an opportunity to receive an empowerment, the details of what the deity is, you know, two-arm, four-arm, wrathful, peaceful, male, female, uh, one head, two heads, yeah, red color, blue color, yellow color, doesn't matter. If you go with the right attitude, that, oh, it's good to receive. Because each time I go, I, I give myself a chance to further understand the meaning of this and further understand the meaning of this. Then this will build up. And then one day, you know, you go and you go, oh, yes, I understand what this means now. Then on that basis, you practice and practice and practice. So until, right, the path of seeing the first Bhumi is truly achieved, then you continue on. Questions? No questions? Good. Then we're going to stop here. Uh, tonight there is Dragon Dharma Kirti. Uh, then this Friday we will not have class. Just this Friday we will not have class. Uh, then this Saturday is the third of the uh, three Saturdays of Kenjin Rinpoche teaching and the end of that series. And then 
probably nothing until January or February or somewhere around there. Uh, still figuring out Rinpoche's schedule. Uh, but Rinpoche is uh, teaching uh, this Sunday as well to the Vietnamese on the four dharmas of Gampopa. Uh, those teachings uh, will be live casted on Facebook. Mm. Even though it's being translated, you know, into Vietnamese, so it's a little longer, right? Uh, but those teachings, I think, are really good uh, if 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 you're still kind of new. But in this group, you're not that new anymore. You know, you've been studying the Gong Chik. Yeah? And, and I think uh, with you having studied the Gong Chik, you, you can see more, you know, when Ken Chen Rinpoche is teaching. Like uh, the, the depth of, you know, so it's, it's like, you know, you, you are hearing him differently from most of the other people hearing him teach. Because you have now this background of Gong Chik, uh, and everything that he teaches uh, is either Gong Chik or Gampopa. Basically, and Gong Chik, Gampopa, to some degree, Milarepa. Uh, he uses examples from Milarepa, but as, as a system, more systematic, uh, what lies behind uh, for Kenjin Rinpoche, it's all Gong Chik and Gampopa. Uh, and so when you listen to him, you know, I, I can tell you, you, it's not like everybody else who is listening. So you have now this kind of background and advantage. Yeah. Chang Chu Sem Chu Ma kye pa nam kye gyu che Kye pa nyam pa me pa yam Gong ne gong du bel war shu Okay, see you all tonight. Gracias. Buenos días. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.